Part 1. Production, Distribution, and Consumption Chapter 1. Wealth Abstract. Cantillon defines wealth as the consumption goods produced by land and labor. This contrasted with the mercantilists who thought money was wealth. Land is the source or matter from which all wealth is drawn. Man's labor provides the form for its production, and wealth in itself is nothing but the food, conveniences, and pleasures of life. Land produces grass, roots, grain, flax, cotton, hemp, shrubs, and several kinds of trees with fruit, bark, and foliage, like that of the mulberry tree for silkworms, and it supplies mines and minerals. From these, the labor of man creates wealth. Rivers and seas provide fish for the food of man, and many other things for his enjoyment. But these seas and rivers belong to the adjacent lands or are common to all, and man's labor extracts fish and other advantages from them. Chapter 2. Human Societies Abstract. All human societies are based on a system of property rights. The distribution of rights will necessarily be unequal, and the use to which property is put will be dependent on the tastes of the owners. Whichever way a society of men is formed, the ownership of the land they inhabit will necessarily belong to a small number among them. In nomadic societies like the Tartar hordes and Indian tribes, who go from one place to another with their animals and families, the king or leader must fix the boundaries for households and neighborhoods around the camp. Otherwise, there would always be disputes over living quarters or access to life's conveniences, such as forests, pastures, water, etc. However, when the districts and boundaries are settled for all, it is as good as ownership while they stay in that place. In the more settled societies, if a prince at the head of an army has conquered a country, he will distribute the lands among his officers or friends according to their merit or his pleasure, as was originally the case in France. He will then establish laws to maintain property rights for them and their descendants. Or he will reserve the ownership of the land to himself and employ his officers or friends to cultivate it. He may also grant the land to them on condition that they pay an annual royalty or rent or he may grant it to them while reserving the right to tax them every year according to his needs and their capacity. In all these cases, the officers or friends, whether independent owners or dependents, whether administrators or supervisors of the production of the land, will be few in number compared to all the inhabitants. Even if the prince distributes the land equally among all the inhabitants, it will ultimately be divided among a small number. One man will have several children and will not be able to leave each of them a portion of land equal to his own. Another will die without children and will leave his portion to someone who has land already rather than to one who has none. A third will be lazy, extravagant, or sickly and be obliged to sell his portion to someone more frugal and industrious who will continually add to his state by new purchases on which he will employ the labor of those who having no land of their own are obliged to offer him their labor in order to subsist. At the first settlement of Rome, each citizen was given two units of land. Yet soon after, there was as great an inequality among inheritances as what we observe today in all the countries of Europe. The land eventually was divided among a few owners. Assuming then that the lands of a new country belong to a small number of people, each owner will manage his land himself or lease it to one or more farmers. In this economy, it is essential that the farmers and laborers should have a living whether the land is exploited by the owner or by the farmers. The owner receives the surplus of the land and he will give part of it to the prince or the government or the farmers will give this part directly to the prince on behalf of the owner. As for the use to which the land should be put, the first necessity is to employ part of it for the maintenance and food of those who work the land and make it productive. The rest depends mainly upon the desires and lifestyle of the prince, the lords of the state, and the property owner. If they are fond of wine, vineyards must be cultivated. If they are fond of silk, mulberry trees must be planted and silkworms raised. Moreover, part of the land must be employed to support those who supply these ones. If they delight in horses, pastures are needed, and so on. However, if we assume that the lands belong to no one in particular, it is difficult to conceive how a society of men can be formed there. We see, for example, that for the communal lands of a village, there is a fixed number of animals that each of the inhabitants are allowed to maintain. 
And if the land were left to the first occupier in a new conquest or discovery of a country, the establishment of ownership would inevitably have to be based on some rule in order for a society to be established, whether the rule is determined by force or by law. Chapter 3. Villages Abstract In this first of four chapters on economic geography and location theory, Cantillon explains that settlements are based on the requirements of production, especially the quantity of labor and the extent of the specialization and division of labor. However the land is used, whether pasture, wheat, vineyards, etc., the farmers or laborers who carry on the work must live nearby. Otherwise, the time spent going to their fields and returning to their houses would consume too much of the day. Hence the necessity for villages widespread in all the countryside and cultivated lands where there also must be enough blacksmiths and wagon makers for the tools, plows, and carts that are needed, especially when the village is far from the towns. The size of a village is naturally proportioned to the number of inhabitants the land requires for daily work, and to the artisans who find enough employment there by serving the farmers and laborers. However, these artisans are not quite so necessary in the vicinity of towns where the laborers can travel without much loss of time. If one or more of the property owners resides in the village, the number of inhabitants will be greater in proportion to the domestic servants and artisans attracted there, and inns will be established for the convenience of the domestic servants and workmen who earn a living from the property owners. If the land is only suitable for maintaining sheep, as in the sandy districts and moorlands, the villages will be fewer and smaller because only a few shepherds are required on the land. If the land consists of sandy soil where only trees grow and there is no grass for livestock and it is distant from towns and rivers, the trees will be useless for consumption. As in many areas of Germany, there will only be as many houses and villages as are needed to gather acorns and feed pigs in season. And if the land is sterile, there will be no villages or inhabitants. Chapter 4. Market Towns Abstract Entrepreneurs establish markets in centrally located villages, which provide the necessary conditions under which prices are established between supply and demand. The size of the market town depends on the size of the economy it serves. There are villages where markets have been established by the interest of some property owner or royal resident. These markets, held once or twice a week, encourage several little entrepreneurs and merchants to establish themselves there. In the market, they buy the products bought from the surrounding villages in order to transport them to the larger towns for sale. In the large towns, they exchange them for iron, salt, sugar, and other merchandise, which they sell on market days to the villagers. Many small artisans, like locksmiths, cabinet makers, and others, also settle down in these places to serve the villagers, and as a result, these villages become market towns. A market town being located in the center of the village whose people come to the market, it is natural and easier for the villagers to bring their products for sale on market days and to buy the articles they need than it would be for the merchants and entrepreneurs to transport the merchandise to the villages and exchange them for the villagers' products. Number 1. For the merchants to go around the villages would unnecessarily increase the cost of transportation. Number 2. The merchants would perhaps be obliged to go to several villages before finding the quality and quantity of product that they wish to buy. Number three, the villagers would generally be in their fields when the merchants arrived, and not knowing what products the merchants desired, they would have nothing prepared and ready for sale. And number four, it would be almost impossible to fix the price of the products and the merchandise in the villages between the merchants and villagers. In one village, the merchant would refuse the price asked for the product, hoping to find it cheaper in another village, and the villager would refuse the price offered for his merchandise in the hope that another merchant would come along and take it on better terms. All these difficulties are avoided when the villagers come to town on market days to sell their product and buy the things they need. Prices are fixed by the proportion between the products displayed for sale and the money offered for it. This takes place in the same spot under the eyes of all the villagers of different villages and of the merchants or entrepreneurs of the town. When the price has been settled between a few, the others follow without difficulty, and so the market price of the day is determined. The peasant then goes back to his village and resumes his work. 
The size of the market town is naturally proportioned to the number of farmers and laborers needed to cultivate the lands dependent on it and to the number of artisans and small merchants that the villages bordering on the market town employ with their assistants and horses. Finally, it also depends on the number of persons supported by the property owners who live in the town. When the village is associated with a market town, i.e. those who ordinarily sell their products in a particular market town, are sizable and have a large output, the market town will become considerable and large in proportion. However, when the neighboring villages have little production, the market town also is poor and insignificant. Chapter 5. Cities Abstract Cities form at sites where large property owners have decided to live. Specialization of labor expands to meet the demands of the wealthy. Cities grow even larger when manufacturing industries produce for export and whose workers are essentially supported by the production of foreign lands. Cantillon placed a great deal of emphasis on transportation costs. He found that property owners who lived far from their lands would experience a reduction in income proportional to the cost of transporting their production to market. The property owners who only have small estates usually reside in market towns and villages near their lands and farmers. The transportation of their production to distant cities would not enable them to live there comfortably. However, property owners that own several large estates have the means to live at a distance from them and enjoy a pleasant society with other property owners and nobility of the same species. If a prince or noble who has received large grants of land at the time of a conquest or discovery of a country fixes his residence in some pleasant spot and several other lords come to live there to be within reach of each other and to enjoy a pleasant society, this place will become a city. Great houses will be built for the nobility in question and many more will be built for the merchants, artisans, and people of all sorts of professions who will be attracted there. These noblemen will require bakers, butchers, brewers, wine merchants, and manufacturers of all kinds to service their needs. These entrepreneurs will, in turn, build houses in this location or will rent houses built by other entrepreneurs. There is no great nobleman whose expense upon his house, his retinue, and servants does not maintain merchants and artisans of all kind, as may be seen from the detailed calculations that I had made for the supplement of this essay. All these artisans and entrepreneurs serve each other as well as the nobility. The fact that their upkeep ultimately falls on property owners and nobles is often overlooked. It is not perceived that all the little houses in a city, such as we have described, depend upon and subsist at the expense of the great houses. However, it will be shown later that all the classes and inhabitants of a state live at the expense of the property owners. The city in question will grow larger if the king or the government establishes law courts to which the people of the market towns and villages of the province must have recourse. An increased number of entrepreneurs and artisans of every sort will be needed for the maintenance of the judges and lawyers. If in the same city workshops and factories are established to manufacture beyond home consumption or export and sale abroad, the city will be large in proportion to the workmen and artisans who live there at the expense of foreigners. However, if we put aside these considerations in order to not complicate our subject, we may say that the gathering of several rich property owners living in the same place suffices to form what is called a city. Many cities in Europe, mainly in the interior, owe the number of their inhabitants to this assemblage. In this case, the size of a city is naturally proportioned to the number of property owners living there, or rather to the production of the land which belongs to them, minus the cost of transportation to those whose lands are the furthest away and the part that they are obliged to give to the king or the government, which is usually consumed in the capital. Chapter 6. Capital Cities Abstract. Wherever a government establishes its capital, the city will grow in size because the additional spending attracts labor and businesses to service the government and its employees, and thus it becomes a commercial center for the nation as well. A capital city is formed in the same way as a provincial city. With these differences, the largest property owners in the state reside in the capital. The king or supreme government is established in it and spends the government's revenues there. The Supreme Court of Justice are located there. It is the center of the fashions, 
which all the provinces take as their model, and the property owners who reside in the provinces occasionally spend time in the capital and they send their children there to be educated. Therefore, all the lands in the state contribute more or less to maintain those who dwell in the capital. If a sovereign leader leaves a city to establish residence in another, nobles will follow him and locate their residences with him in the new city, which will become great and important at the expense of the first. We have seen a recent example of this in the city of Petersburg to the disadvantage of Moscow, and one sees many old cities which were important fall into ruin and others spring from their ashes. Great cities are usually built on the seacoast or on the banks of large rivers for the convenience of transportation. Water transportation of the products and merchandise necessary for the subsistence and comfort of the inhabitants is much cheaper than wagons and land transportation. Chapter 7. The labor of the plowman is of less value than that of the artisan. Abstract. The opportunity cost of becoming a skilled worker includes both the direct expenses as well as the foregone labor during the training period or apprenticeship. As a result, skilled workers must be paid higher wages than unskilled workers. A laborer's son at 7 to 12 years of age begins to help his father either in keeping the herds, digging the ground, or in other sorts of country labor that require no art or skill. If his father has taught him a trade, he loses his assistance during the time of his apprenticeship and is obligated to clothe him and to pay the expenses of his apprenticeship for many years. The son is thus dependent on his father and his labor brings in no advantage for several years. The working life of man is estimated at only 10 to 12 years and as several are lost in learning a trade, most of which in England require seven years of apprenticeship, a plowman would never be willing to have a trade taught to his son if the artisans did not earn more than the plowman. Therefore, those who employ artisans or professionals must pay for their labor at a higher rate than for that of a plowman or common laborer. Their labor will necessarily be expensive in proportion to the time lost in learning the trade and the cost and risk incurred in becoming proficient. The professionals themselves do not make all their children learn their own trade. There would be too many of them for the needs of a city or a state, and many would not find enough work. However, the work is naturally better paid than that of plowmen. Chapter 8. Some artisans earn more, others less, according to the different cases and circumstances. Abstract. In addition to training and the forces of supply and demand, workers with higher quality skills, risky jobs, or jobs which require trustworthy employees will receive higher wages. This is now known as the theory of compensating differentials that is often attributed to Adam Smith. If two tailors make all the clothes of a village, one may have more customers than the other, whether from his way of attracting business, because his products are better or more durable than the other, or because he follows the fashions better in the style of his garments. If one dies, the other, finding himself with more work, will be able to raise the price of his labor, expediting the work of some in preference to others, until the villagers find it to their advantage to have their clothes made in another village, town, or city, losing the time spent in going and returning, or until another tailor comes to live in their village and shares the business. The jobs which require the most time and training or most ingenuity and in industry must necessarily be the best paid. A skillful cabinet maker must receive a higher price for his work than an ordinary carpenter and a good clock and watchmaker more than a blacksmith. The arts and occupations which are accompanied by risks and dangers like those of foundry workers, sailors, silver miners, etc. ought to be paid in proportion to the risks. When skill is needed, over and above the dangers, they ought to be paid even more, such as ship pilots, divers, engineers, etc. When capacity and trustworthiness are needed, the labor is paid still more highly, as in the case of jewelers, bookkeepers, cashiers, and others. By these examples, and a hundred others we could draw from ordinary experience, it is easily seen that the differences in the prices paid for labor is based upon natural and obvious reasons. Chapter 9. The number of laborers, artisans, and others who work in a state is naturally proportioned to the demand for them. Abstract. 
The supply of workers adjusts itself to the demand for labor across all professions via wage rates, migration, and changes in population. Prosperity cannot be created by subsidizing job training. If all the farm laborers in a village raise several sons to the same work, there will be too many farm laborers to cultivate the lands of the village, and the surplus adults will have to leave in order to seek a livelihood elsewhere, which they generally find in cities. If some remain with their fathers, as they will not all find sufficient employment, they will live in great poverty and not marry for lack of means to raise children. If they do marry, their children will soon die of starvation with their parents, as we see every day in France. Therefore, if the village continues in the same employment pattern and derives its living from cultivating the same area of land, its population will not increase in a thousand years. It is true that women and girls of this village can, when they are not working in the fields, occupy themselves in spinning, knitting, or other work that can be sold in the cities. However, this rarely suffices to support the extra children who leave the village to seek their fortune elsewhere. The same may be said of the artisans of a village. If a tailor makes all the clothes for the villagers and then raises three sons to the same job, there will only be enough work for one successor to him, and the other two must seek their livelihood elsewhere. If they do not find employment in the neighboring town, they must move further away or change their occupations and earn a living by becoming servants, soldiers, sailors, etc. By the same process of reasoning, it is easy to conceive that the laborers, artisans, and others who earn their living by working must proportion themselves in number to the employment and demand for them in market towns and cities. If four tailors are enough to make all the clothes for a town, and a fifth arrives, he may find some work at the expense of the other four. Therefore, if the labor is divided between the five tailors, neither of them will have enough work, and each one will live more poorly. It often happens that laborers and artisans do not have enough employment when there are too many of them to share the business. It also happens that they can be deprived of work by accidents and by variations in demand or that they are overburdened with work according to the circumstances. Be that as it may, when they have no work, they leave the villages, towns, or cities where they live in such numbers, and those who remain are always proportioned to the employment that suffices to maintain them. When there is a continuous increase of work, there are gains to be made, and others will move in to share the business. From this, it is easy to understand that the charity schools in England and the proposals in France to increase the number of artisans are useless. If the King of France sent 100,000 of his subjects at his expense into Holland to learn seafaring, they would be of no use when they returned if no more vessels were sent to sea than before. It is true that it would be a great advantage for a state to teach its subjects to produce the manufactured goods that are customarily drawn from abroad and all the other articles bought there, but I am, at present, only considering a state in relation to itself. As the artisans earn more than the laborers, they are better able to raise their children into professions, and there will never be a lack of artisans in a state where there is enough work for their constant employment. Chapter 10. The price and intrinsic value of a thing, in general, is the measurement of the land and labor which enter into its production. Abstract. Intrinsic value can be measured by the quantity of land and laborers, taking into account the quality of land and labor. Some goods are produced almost entirely with land, others solely from labor. In the garden example, intrinsic value is both the direct expense of the garden and the foregone value of the land. Intrinsic value of a choice never changes, but market prices vary according to demand. Cantillon's construction of intrinsic value should therefore be understood as the concept of opportunity cost, not the essential nature of a thing. One acre of land produces more wheat or feeds more sheep than another. The work of one man is more expensive than that of another, as I have already explained according to superior skill and circumstances of the time. If two acres of land are of equal quality, one will feed as many sheep and produce as much wool as the other, assuming the labor to be the same. In addition, the wool produced by one acre will be the same and will sell at the same price as that produced by the other. If the wool of the one acre is made into a suit of coarse cloth, and the wool of the other into a suit of fine cloth, the latter will require more work and more expensive workmanship, and it will sometimes be ten times more expensive, though both contain the same quantity and quality of wool. 
The quantity of the production of the land and the quantity as well as the quality of the labor will necessarily enter into the price. A pound of flax processed into fine Brussels lace requires the labor of 14 persons for a year, or of one person for 14 years, as may be seen in the supplement from a calculation of the different processes. We also see that the price obtained for the lace is sufficient to pay for the maintenance of one person for 14 years, as well as the profits of all the entrepreneurs and merchants concerned. The refined steel spring, which regulates an English watch, is generally sold at a price that makes the proportion of material to labor, or of steel to spring, one to one million. In this case, labor makes up nearly all the value of the spring. See the calculation in the supplement. On the other hand, the price of hay in a field, on the spot, or of trees we wish to cut down, is regulated by the material production of the land according to its quality. The price for taking a jug of water from the Seine River is nothing, because there is an immense supply, which does not dry up. However, in the streets of Paris, people give a sol for it, which is the price or measure for the labor of the water carrier. By these examples and inductions, I believe it will be understood that the price or intrinsic value of a thing is the measurement of the quantity of land and of labor entering into its production, having regard to the fertility or productivity of the land and to the quality of the labor. But it often happens that many things which actually have a certain intrinsic value are not sold in the market according to that value. That will depend on the desires and moods of men and on their consumption. If a gentleman digs ditches and raises terraces in his garden, their intrinsic value will be proportional to the land and the labor. But the price, in reality, will not always follow this proportion. If he offers to sell the garden, it is possible that no one will give him half the expense he has incurred. It is also possible that if several persons desire it, he may be given double the intrinsic value. That is twice the value of the land and the expense he has incurred. If the farmers in a state sow more wheat than usual, i.e. much more than they should for the year's consumption, the real and intrinsic value of the wheat will correspond to the land and labor which enter into its production. However, as there is too great an abundance of it and there are more sellers than buyers, the market price of the wheat will necessarily fall below the price or intrinsic value. If, on the contrary, the farmer sow less wheat than is needed for consumption, there will be more buyers than sellers and the market price of wheat will rise above its intrinsic value. There is never variation in the intrinsic value of things, but the impossibility of proportioning the production of goods and products in a state to their consumption causes a daily variation and a perpetual ebb and flow in market prices. However, in well-ordered societies, the market prices of commodities and merchandise, whose consumption is relatively constant and uniform, do not vary much from the intrinsic value. In addition, in years when production is not too meager or too abundant, the city officials are even able to fix the market prices of many things, like bread and meat, without anyone having cause to complain. Land provides the matter and labor the form of all commodities and merchandise, and as those who work must subsist on the production of the land, it seems that some par value or ratio between labor and the production of the land might be found. This will form the subject of the next chapter. Chapter 11. The Par Value or Ratio Between the Value of Land and Labor Abstract William Petty set off the search for a par value between land and labor. Cantillon provides a theoretical answer, referenced in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, that property owners must provide their labor with the production of at least twice the land necessary to sustain the worker in order that enough children are raised to maintain the workforce over time. The amount of land will actually vary from job to job, person to person, and among different countries and societies. Therefore, the practical circumstances of the world dictate that there is no such par value between land and labor, only money, a most certain measure, can be used for income measurements and comparisons. It does not appear that providence gave the right of land possession to one man over another. The most ancient titles are found on violence and conquest. The lands of Mexico belong today to the Spaniards and those of Jerusalem to the Turks. But however, people come to the ownership and possession of land. We already have observed that it always falls into the hands of a smaller number of people compared to the total number of inhabitants. If the owner of a great estate manages it himself, he will employ slaves or free men to work upon it. If he has many slaves, he must have supervisors to make them work. 
He must likewise have slave artisans to supply goods and life's pleasures for himself and his workers, and must have skills taught to others in order to carry on the work. In this economy, he must provide his laboring slaves their subsistence and wherewithal to raise their children. The supervisors must receive advantages proportional to the confidence and authority that they possess. The slaves who are being taught a craft must be maintained without any return during the time of their apprenticeship. In addition, the artisan slaves and their supervisors, who should be competent in the crafts, must have a better subsistence than the laboring slaves, etc., because the loss of an artisan would be greater than that of a laborer, and more care must be taken of him, given the expense of training another to take his place. On this assumption, the labor of an adult slave of the lowest class is worth at least as much as the quantity of land that the owner is obliged to allot for his food and necessities, and also to double the land which serves to raise a child until he is of age or fit for labor. Knowing that half of the children born die before the age of seventeen, according to the calculations and observations of the celebrated Dr. Halley, two children must be reared in order to maintain one of them until working age. And it seems that even this would not be enough to ensure a continuance of the labor force, because adult men die at all ages. It is true that the one half of the children who die before seventeen more die in the first years after birth than in the following years, with at least one third dying in their first year. This seems to diminish the cost of raising a child to working age. However, as the mothers lose much time in nursing their children in illness and infancy. And the daughters, even when grown up, are not the equals of the males in work and barely earn their living. It seems that to maintain one or two children to manhood or working age, as much land must be employed as for the subsistence of an adult slave. This is true whether the owner raises the children himself in his house or has them raised there, or if the slave father brings them up in a house or hamlet apart. Therefore, I conclude that the daily labor of the lowest slave corresponds in value to double the produce of the land required to maintain him, whether the owner gives it to him for his subsistence and that of his family, or provides him and his family with subsistence in his own house. This matter does not allow for an exact calculation, and exactitude is not very necessary. It suffices to be near enough to the truth. If the owner employs the labor of vassals or free peasants, he will probably maintain them better than slaves, according to the custom of the place where he lives. Yet in this case, the work of a free laborer also ought to correspond in value to double the product of land needed for his maintenance. However, it will always be more profitable for the owner to maintain slaves than to maintain free peasants, because when he has raised too many slaves for his requirement, he can sell the surplus as he does his cattle. And obtain for them a price proportionate to what he has spent in rearing them to manhood or working age, except in cases of old age or infirmity. In the same way, one may apprise the labor of slave artisans at twice the production of the land that they consume, and that of supervisors likewise, because of the favors and privileges given to them above those who work under them. When the artisans or laborers have their double portion at their own disposal, they employ one part of it for their own upkeep. And the other for their children, if they are married. If they are unmarried, they set aside a little of their double portion to enable them to marry and save a little for the household. However, most of them will consume the double portion for their own maintenance. For example, the married laborer will be satisfied to live on bread, cheese, vegetables, etc. Will rarely eat meat, will drink little wine or beer, and will have only old and shabby clothes, which he will wear for as long as he can. The surplus of his double portion will be used to raise and maintain his children. On the other hand, the unmarried laborer will eat meat as often as he can, will buy himself new clothes, etc., and use his double portion on his own maintenance. Thus, he will personally consume twice as much of the produce of the land as the married man. I do not here take into account the expense of the wife. I assume that her labor barely suffices to pay for her own living. And when one sees a large number of little children in one of these poor families, I assume that charitable persons contribute something to their maintenance. Otherwise, the parents must deprive themselves of some of the necessities to provide for their children. To better understand this, it is to be observed that a poor laborer may maintain himself at the lowest estimate upon the produce of an acre and a half of land, if he lives on bread and vegetables, wears hemp garments, wooden shoes, etc. However, if he can allow himself wine, meat, woolen clothes, etc., 
He may, without drunkenness or gluttony, or excess of any kind, consume the product of four to ten acres of land of average quality. Such is the case with most of the land in Europe. I had some calculations made which will be found in the supplement in order to determine the yearly amount of land which one man can consume the product of under each category of food, clothing, and other necessaries of life according to the ways of life found in Europe, where peasants in different countries often are nourished and maintained very differently. This is why I did not determine how much land corresponds in value to the work of the cheapest peasant or laborer when I wrote that it was worth double the product of the land used to maintain him, because that varies according to the ways of life in different countries. In some southern provinces of France, the peasant maintains himself on the product of one acre and a half of land, and the value of his labor may be reckoned equal to the product of three acres. But in the county of Middlesex, the peasant usually consumes the product of five to eight acres of land, and his labor may be valued at twice as much. In the country of the Iroquois, where the inhabitants do not plow the land and live entirely by hunting, the common hunter may consume the product of 50 acres of land, since it probably requires this amount to maintain the animals he eats in one year, especially as these savages have not the industry to grow grass by cutting down some trees, but leave everything to nature. The labor of this hunter may then be reckoned equal in value to the product of 100 acres of land. In the southern provinces of China, the land yields up to three crops of rice per year and can bring in each time up to a hundred times as much as is sown. This is because of the great care they take with agriculture and the fertility of the soil, which is never fallow. The peasants who work almost naked live only on rice and drink only rice water, and it appears that one acre can support more than ten peasants. It is not surprising, therefore, to see extraordinary population numbers. In any case, it seems from these examples that nature is altogether indifferent whether land produces grass, trees, or grain, or maintains a large or small number of vegetables, animals, or men. Farmers in Europe seem to correspond to supervisors of laboring slaves in other countries, and the master artisans who employ several journeymen artisans to the supervisors of artisan slaves. These master artisans know approximately how much work a journeyman artisan can do in a day in each craft, and often pay them in proportion to the work they do, so that the journeymen work as hard as they can in their own interest without further supervision. As the farmers and master artisans in Europe are all entrepreneurs working at risk, some get rich and gain more than double their subsistence. Others are ruined and become bankrupt, as will be explained more in detail in the Analysis of Entrepreneurs, Part 1, Chapter 13. However, the majority support themselves and their families from day to day, and their labor or supervision may be valued at approximately three times the product of the land that serves for their maintenance. Evidently, these farmers and master artisans, if they are supervising the labor of ten laborers or journeymen artisans, would be equally capable of supervising the labor of twenty according to the size of their farms or the number of their customers. This renders uncertain the value of their labor or supervision. By these examples and others of the same sort that could be added, it is seen that the value of the day's work has a relation to the product of the soil. The intrinsic value of anything may be measured by the quantity of land used in its production and the quantity of labor which enters into it, that is to say by the quantity of land of which the product is allotted to the laborers. As all the land belongs to the prince and the property owners, all things that have this intrinsic value have it only at their expense. The money or coin which finds the proportion of values in exchange is the most certain measure for judging on the par between the land and labor and the ratio of one to the other in different countries. This par varies according to the greater or less produce of the land allotted to those who labor. If, for example, one man earns an ounce of silver every day by his work and another in the same place earns only half an ounce, one can conclude that the first has twice the amount of the production of the land to spend as the second. Sir William Petty, in a little manuscript of the year 1685, considered this par or equation between land and labor as the most important consideration in political arithmetic. However, the research he made in passing is fanciful and remote from natural laws because he has attached himself not to causes and principles, but only to effects, as Mr. Locke, Mr. Davenant, and all the other English authors who have written on the subject have done after him. Chapter 12
All classes and individuals in a state subsist or grow rich at the expense of the property owners. Abstract. Cantillon develops a circular flow model of the economy that shows the distribution of farm production between property owners, farmers, and workers. Farm production is exchanged for the goods and services produced in the cities by entrepreneurs and artisans. While the property owners are independent, the model demonstrates the mutual interdependence between all the classes of people that Adam Smith dubbed the invisible hand in the Theory of Moral Sentiments, 1759. There are none but the prince and the property owners who live independent. All other classes and inhabitants are hired or are entrepreneurs. The proof and details of this will be developed in the next chapter. If the prince and property owners close their estates and will not allow them to be cultivated, it is clear there would be neither food nor clothing for any of the inhabitants of the state. Consequently, all the individuals of the state are supported not only by the product of the land that is cultivated for the benefit of the owners, but also at the expense of these same owners from whose property they derive all that they have. The farmers generally have two-thirds of the product of the land, one for their expenses and the maintenance of their assistance, the other for the profit of their enterprise. On these two-thirds, the farmer generally provides directly or indirectly subsistence for all those who live in the country and also for artisans and entrepreneurs in the city because of the goods from the city that are consumed in the countryside. The owner usually has one-third of the product of his land, and on this third he maintains all the artisans and others whom he employs in the city as well. This often includes those who bring the goods from the countryside to the city. It is generally assumed that one half of the inhabitants of a state must subsist and reside in the cities, and the other half live in the country. That being the case, the farmer who has two-thirds or four-sixths of the product of the land pays directly or indirectly one-sixth to the city residents in exchange for the goods he acquires from them. This six with the one-third or two-sixths that the owner spends in the city makes three-sixths or one-half of the products of the land. This calculation is only to convey a general idea of the proportion, but in fact, if half of the inhabitants live in the cities, they consume more than half of the land's products. They live better than those who reside in the countryside and consume more of the production of the land because all artisans and dependents of the property owners are better maintained than the assistance and dependents of the farmers. In any event, if we examine the means by which an inhabitant is supported, one will always find when going back to the source that their income comes from the owner's land, either in the two-thirds of the product reserved by the farmer or the one-third that remains with the owner. If a property owner only had enough land for one farmer, the farmer would get a better living out of it than the owner would. However, the nobles and large property owners in the city sometimes have several hundred farmers, and thus there are very few owners in proportion to all the inhabitants of the state. It is true that there are often several entrepreneurs and artisans in the large cities who live by foreign trade, and therefore at the expense of foreign landowners. But at present, I am only considering a state with regard to its production and with its own industry, in order to avoid cluttering my argument with accidental circumstances. The land belongs to the owners, but would be useless to them if it were not cultivated. The more labor is expended on it, other things being equal, the more it produces, and the more its products are refined, other things being equal, the more value they have as goods. Therefore, the owners need the inhabitants as they need the owners. However, in this economy, it is the property owners who have control and direction of the landed capital to give the most advantageous turn and movement to the whole. Also, everything in a state depends mainly on the moods, modes, and ways of life of the property owners, as I will try to clearly show in the remainder of this essay. Thus, need and necessity enable farmers, artisans of every kind, merchants, officers, soldiers, sailors, domestic servants, and all the other classes who work or are employed in the state to exist. All these working people serve not only the prince and the property owners, but each other as well. Many of them do not work directly for the property owners, and so it is not seen that they subsist on the capital of these proprietors and live at their expense. As for those whose professions are not essential, like dancers, actors, painters, musicians, etc., they are only supported in the state for pleasure or ornamentation, and their number is always very small compared to the population. Chapter 13. The circulation and exchange of goods and merchandise, as well as their production, are carried on in Europe by entrepreneurs and at a risk. Abstract. Here Cantillon introduces for the first time the theory of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs are the prime directors of resources. Their occupations come with risks due to uncertainty, especially from competition and changing tastes. 
As a result, their income can be very large, but they also face the prospect of bankruptcy. The property owner is independent in having a large income, rent, from the land, and the capitalist or large money owner also can live independently on interest. Everyone else is ultimately dependent on the expenditures of property owners for their livelihoods. The farmer is an entrepreneur who promises to pay the property owner for his farm or land a fixed sum of money, generally assumed to be equal in value to a third of the production, without assurance of the profit he will derive from his enterprise. He employs part of the land to feed herds, produce grain, wine, hay, etc., according to his judgment, without being able to foresee which of these will pay the best price. The price of these products will depend partly on the weather, partly on the demand. If wheat is abundant compared to consumption, it will sell at a cheap price. If there is scarcity, it will be expensive. Who can predict the number of births or deaths that will occur during the current year? Who can foresee the increase or reduction in expenditures that can occur in families? And yet, the price of the farmer's product naturally depends upon these unforeseen circumstances, and consequently, he conducts the enterprise of his farm with uncertainty. The city consumes more than half of the farmer's products. He carries it to the market or sells it in the market of the nearest town, or perhaps to entrepreneurs who provide the transport. They obligate themselves to pay the farmer a fixed price for his products, the market price of the day, to receive an uncertain price in the city, which should nonetheless defray the cost of transport and leave them a profit. However, the daily variation in the price of products in the city, though not considerable, makes their profit uncertain. The entrepreneur or merchant who transports the products of the countryside to the city cannot stay there to sell them at retail until the products are consumed. No family in a city will burden itself with the purchase at one time of the products it may need over time because each family is susceptible to increase or decrease in size and consumption or at least to variation in the choice of products it will consume. Wine is almost the only article of consumption stocked by families. In any case, the majority of citizens live from day to day, and even the largest consumers will not be able to stock away products from the countryside. For this reason, many people set up as merchants or entrepreneurs in the city to buy the country products from those who bring it or to have it brought on their account. They pay a fixed price for them at the place where they are purchased to resell wholesale or retail at an uncertain price. Such entrepreneurs are the wholesalers of wool and grain and the bakers, butchers, manufacturers, and merchants of all kinds who buy country production and materials to work them up and resell them gradually as the inhabitants require them for consumption. These entrepreneurs never know how great the demand will be in their city, nor how long their customers will buy from them since their rivals will try, by all sorts of means, to attract their customers. All this causes so much uncertainty among these entrepreneurs that every day one sees some of them go bankrupt. The manufacturer who has bought wool from the merchant or directly from the farmer cannot know the profit he will make in selling his cloths and fabrics to the tailor. If the latter does not have reasonable sales, he will not burden himself with the cloths and fabrics of the manufacturer, especially if those fabrics have gone out of fashion. The draper or clothier is an entrepreneur who buys cloths and fabrics from the manufacturer at a certain price in order to sell them again at an uncertain price, because he cannot foresee the extent of the demand. He can, of course, fix a price and abstain from selling unless he gets it. However, if his customers leave him to buy cheaper from another, he will be consumed by expenses while waiting to sell at the price he demands, and that will ruin him as soon or sooner than if he sold without profit. Shopkeepers and retailers of every kind are entrepreneurs who buy at a certain price and sell in their shops or the markets at an uncertain price. What encourages and maintains these entrepreneurs in a state is the fact that the consumers, who are their customers, prefer paying a little more to get what they want promptly and in small quantities rather than having to stock up. In addition, most of them do not have the means to stock up by buying from wholesalers. All these entrepreneurs become consumers and customers of each other, the draper of the wine merchant, and vice versa. In a state, they proportion themselves to the customers or their consumption. If there are too many hat makers in a city or on a street, for the number of people who buy hats, the least patronized must go bankrupt. On the other hand, if there are too few, it will be a profitable business, which will encourage new hat makers to open shops, and in this manner, entrepreneurs of all kinds adjust themselves to risk in a state. All the other entrepreneurs, like those who take charge of mines, theaters, buildings, 
the traders by sea and land, restaurateurs, pastry cooks, innkeepers, etc., as well as the entrepreneurs of their own labor who need no capital to establish themselves, like journeymen, artisans, coppersmiths, seamstresses, chimney sweeps, water transporters, live with uncertainty and proportion themselves to their customers. Master craftsmen like shoemakers, tailors, carpenters, wig makers, etc., who employ journeymen according to the work they have, live with the same uncertainty since their customers may leave them any day. The entrepreneurs of their own labor in art and science, like painters, physicians, lawyers, etc., live in the same uncertainty. If one attorney or lawyer earns 5,000 livres sterling per year in the service of his clients or in his practice, and another earns only 500, their income is just as uncertain as those that employ them. It may perhaps be urged that entrepreneurs seek to snatch all they can in their calling and to get the better of their customers, but this is outside of my subject. By all these inductions and an affinity of others that could be made to extend this matter to the entire population of the state, it may be established that, except for the prince and the property owners, all the inhabitants of a state are dependent. They can be divided into two classes, entrepreneurs and hired workers. The entrepreneurs are on unfixed wages, while the others are on fixed wages as long as there is work, although their functions and ranks may be very unequal. The general who has his pay, the courtier his pension, and the domestic servant who has wages all fall into this last class. All the others are entrepreneurs, whether they are set up with capital to conduct their enterprise or are entrepreneurs of their own labor without capital, and they may be regarded as living under uncertainty. Even the beggars and the robbers are entrepreneurs of this class. Finally, all the inhabitants of a state derive their living and their advantages from the property of the landowners and are dependent. It is true, however, that if some person on high wages or some large entrepreneur has saved capital or wealth, that is, if he has reserves of wheat, wool, copper, gold, silver, or some other commodity or merchandise in constant use or circulation in a state having an intrinsic or real value, he may be justly considered independent as long as the capital lasts. He may exchange it to acquire a mortgage and receive income from the land and from public loans secured upon the land. He may even live better than the small landowners and buy property from some of them. But commodities and merchandise, even gold and silver, are much more subject to accident and loss than the ownership of land. And however one may have earned or saved them, they are always derived from the land of actual owners, either by wages or by the saving of wages destined for one subsistence. The number of money owners in a large state is often quite considerable. Though the value of all the money that circulates in the state barely exceeds the ninth or tenth part of the value of the production drawn from this soil, because the proprietors of money lend considerable amounts from which they receive interest, either by a mortgage on land or the commodities and merchandise of the state, the sums due to them usually exceed all the money in the state. They often become so powerful a body that they could, in certain cases, rival the property owners if the owners were not often also money owners and if the owners of large sums of money did not also seek to become property owners themselves. Nevertheless, it is always true that all the sums earned or saved have been drawn from the land of the current owners. However, because so many property owners in a state ruin themselves daily, and those who acquire the property take their place, the independence given by the ownership of land applies only to those who keep possession of it. As all land always has a master or current owner, it is from their property that all the inhabitants of the state derive their living and all their wealth. If these owners confine themselves to living within their rental income, this would be beyond question. And in that case, it would be much more difficult for the other inhabitants to grow rich at their expense. I will therefore establish as a principle that the property owners alone are naturally independent in a state. All the other classes are dependent, whether entrepreneurs are hired, and that all the exchange and circulation of the state is conducted by the actions of these entrepreneurs. Chapter 14. The desires, fashions, and ways of life of the prince, and especially of the property owners, determine the use to which land is put in a state and cause the variations in the market prices of all things. Abstract. Cantillon constructs a model of the isolated estate or closed economy, where the choices of property owners determine outputs and prices, regardless if they manage the isolated estate or lease it to farmers. Mistakes of the farmers or changes in demand by the property owners cause changes in prices, profits, and losses, which drive the economy back to equilibrium. The result is that the price system directs resources to the same outcome as that provided by the direct management of the estate owner, 
a la Adam Smith's use of the invisible hand in The Wealth of Nations. If the owner of a large estate, that I wish to consider here as if there were no other in the world, cultivated it himself, he will follow his desires in the uses he puts it to. Number one, he will necessarily use part of it for grain to feed the laborers, artisans, and supervisors who work for him, and another part to feed the cattle, sheep, and other animals necessary for their clothing and food or other conveniences, according to the way in which he wishes to maintain them. Number two, he will turn part of the land into parks, gardens, fruit trees, or vines, according to his inclinations, and into meadows for the horses he will use for his pleasure, etc. Let us now assume that to avoid all the care and trouble, he makes a deal with the supervisors of the laborers, gives them farms or pieces of land, and leaves to them the responsibility for maintaining, in the usual manner, all the laborers they supervise. The supervisors, now farmers or entrepreneurs, give the laborers, for working on the land or farm, another third of the production for their food, clothing, and other requirements, such as they had when the owner employed them. Assume further that the owner makes a deal with the supervisors of the artisans for the food and other conveniences that he gave them, that he makes the supervisors become master artisans, fixes a common measure like silver to settle the price at which the farmers will supply them with wool and they will supply him with cloth, and that the prices give the master craftsmen the same advantages and enjoyments they had when they were supervisors and maintain the journeyman artisans the same as before. The artisan's work will be paid for by the day or by the piece, and the merchandise they have made, hats, stockings, shoes, clothes, etc., will be sold to the property owners, farmers, laborers, and other artisans reciprocally at prices that leave all of them with the same advantages as before. The farmer will sell at a proportionate price their produce and raw material. It will then come to pass that the supervisors, now entrepreneurs, will become the absolute masters of those who work under them and they will have more care and satisfaction in working on their own account. We assume that after this change, all the people on this large estate live just as they did before, and all the portions and farms of this great estate will be put to the same use as they formerly were. If some of the farmers sowed more grain than usual, they will feed fewer sheep and have less wool and mutton to sell. Consequently, there will be too much grain and too little wool for the consumption of the inhabitants. Wool will be expensive, which will force the inhabitants to wear their clothes longer than usual, and there will be too much grain and a surplus for the following year. And as we assume that the property owner has stipulated for the payment in silver for the third of the production of the farm that is owed to him, the farmers who have too much grain and too little wool will not be able to pay him the rent. If he excuses them, they will plan to have less grain and more wool for the next year, for farmers always take care to use their land for the production of those things which they think will fetch the best price at the market. If, however, next year they have too much wool and too little grain for the demand, they will not fail to change from year to year the use of the land until they arrive at proportioning their production to the consumption of the inhabitants. Thus, a farmer who has appropriately proportioned his output to consumption will have part of his farm in grass, for hay, another for grain, wool, and so on, and he will not change his plan unless he sees some considerable change in demand. However, in this example, we have assumed that all the people live approximately in the same way as when the property owner cultivated the land for himself, and consequently the farmers will employ the land for the same purposes as before. The owner, who has one-third of the product of the land at his disposal, is the principal agent in the changes that may occur in demand. Laborers and artisans who live from day to day change their way of living only out of necessity. However, some well-to-do farmers, master artisans, and other entrepreneurs whose expenses and compensations vary will always take as their models the nobility and property owners. They imitate them in their clothing, meals, and way of life. If the property owners like to wear fine linen, silk, or lace, the demand for these goods will be greater than that of the owners themselves. If a noble or property owner who has leased out all his lands to farm decides to considerably change his way of life, if, for example, he decreases the number of his domestic servants and increases the number of his horses, not only will his servants be forced to leave the estate in question, but also a proportionate number of artisans and of laborers who work to maintain them. The portion of land that was used to maintain these inhabitants will be turned into pasture for new horses, and if all landowners in the state did the same thing, they would soon increase the number of horses and diminish the number of inhabitants. 
When a property owner has dismissed a great number of domestic servants and increased the number of his horses, there will be too much wheat for the needs of the inhabitants, and so the wheat will be cheap and hay expensive. That will make the farmers enlarge their pastures and decrease wheat production to proportion production with consumption. Thus, the demands of the owners determine the use of the land and when they bring about the variations in demand. This causes variations of market prices. If all the property owners of a state cultivated their own estates, they would use them to produce what they wanted. As the variations of demand are chiefly caused by their way of living, the prices that they offer in the market determine, for the farmers, all the changes that they make in the employment and use of the land. I do not consider here the variations in market prices which may arise from the good or bad harvest of the year, or the extraordinary consumption which may occur from foreign troops or other accidents. In order to not complicate my subject, I am considering only a state in its natural and uniform condition. Chapter 15. The increase and decrease of the number of people in a state chiefly depends on the taste, the fashions, and the ways of life of the property owners. Abstract. Population is based on the tastes and choices of property owners. Early versions of the Malthusian approach to population growth, that it follows some mathematical formula, are criticized. This chapter also shows that the opulence and lavish spending of the prince and absentee landlords living far from their lands was responsible for the poverty and declining population of France, which ultimately led to the French Revolution. Experience shows that trees, plants, and other kind of vegetation can be increased to any quantity, to the extent that the land allocated to them can support. The same experience shows that all the animal species can be multiplied to any quantity that the land allotted to them can support. Horses, cattle, sheep can easily be multiplied up to the number that the land will support. One can even improve the fields allocated for this purpose by irrigation, as in Milan. Hay can be grown to raise cattle in stables and feed them in larger numbers than if they were allowed to freely roam in the fields. Sheep may be fed on turnips, as in England, so that more can be fed with an acre of land than if it were pasture. In a word, we can multiply all sorts of animals in such numbers as we wish to maintain, even to infinite numbers, if we could find lands in infinite quantity to nourish them. And the multiplication of animals has no other bounds than the greater or lesser means allotted for their subsistence. There is no doubt that if all land was devoted to the simple sustenance of man, the race would increase up to the number that the land would support in the manner to be explained. There is no country where population is carried to a greater height than in China. The common people are supported by rice and rice water. They work almost naked, and in the southern provinces they have three plentiful harvests of rice each year thanks to the great care they give to agriculture. The land is never fallow and yields more than a hundredfold every year. Those who wear clothes generally have cotton clothing, which needs so little land for its production that an acre of land, it seems, is capable of producing a quantity of clothing sufficient for 500 adults. The Chinese, by the principle of their religion, are obliged to marry and raise as many children as their means of subsistence will afford. They look upon it as a crime to use land for pleasure gardens or parks, cheating the public of food. They transport travelers in sedan chairs and save the work of horses upon all tasks which men can perform. Their number is incredible, according to the descriptions of China's visitors. However, they are forced to let many of their children die in the cradle when they are unable to support them, keeping only the number they can feed. By hard and persistent labor, they draw from the rivers an extraordinary quantity of fish and from the land all that is possible. Nevertheless, when bad years come, they die of hunger by the thousands in spite of the care of the emperor who stores rice for such contingencies. Numerous then as the people of China are, they are necessarily proportioned to their means of living and do not exceed the number the country can support, according to their standard of living, and on this level, a single acre of land will support many of them. On the other hand, there is no country where the increase of population is more limited than among the savages in the interior parts of America. They neglect agriculture, live in the forests, and live by hunting the animals found there. As the trees consume the sap and substance of the earth, there is little pasture for animals. And since an Indian eats several animals in a year, 50 or 100 acres, often supply only enough food for a single Indian. 
A small tribe of these Indians will have 40 square leagues for its hunting ground. They wage regular and bitter wars over these boundaries and always proportion their numbers to their means of support from hunting. The Europeans cultivate the land and draw grain from it for their subsistence. The wool of their sheep provides them with clothing. Wheat is the grain on which most of them are fed, but some peasants make their bread of rye and in the north from barley and oats. The food of the peasants and the people is not the same in all countries of Europe, and land is often different in quality and fertility. Most of the land in Flanders, and part of that in Lombardy, yields 18 to 20 times the wheat sown without lying idle. The countryside of Naples yields still more. There are some parts of France, Spain, England, and Germany which yield the same amount. Cicero tells us that the land of Sicily in his time yielded tenfold, and the elder Pliny says that the Leontine lands in Sicily yielded a hundred times the seed sown, those of Babylon a hundred and fifty times, and some African lands a good deal more. Today, land in Europe yields on the average six times what is sown, so that five times the seed remains for the consumption of the people. Land usually lays fallow for the third year, producing wheat the first year and barley and oats the second. In the supplement, there are estimates of the amount of land required to support a man according to the different assumptions made about his way of living. It will be seen there that a man who lives on bread, garlic, and roots, wears only hemp garments, coarse linen, wooden shoes, and drinks only water, like many peasants in the south of France, can live on the produce of an acre and a half of land of average quality, yielding a six-fold harvest and laying fallow every third year. On the other hand, an adult man who wears leather shoes, stockings, woolen cloth, who lives in a house and has a change of linen, a bed, chairs, table, and other necessities, moderately drinks beer or wine, eats meat every day, butter, cheese, bread, vegetables, etc., sufficiently and yet moderately, needs less than the product of four to five acres of land of average quality. It is true that in these estimates no land is allotted for horses except those needed to plow and for the transport of the products a distance of 10 miles. History records that the first Romans each maintained his family on two journo of land equal to one Paris acre and approximately 330 square feet. They were almost naked, had no wine or oil, slept in straw, and hardly had any comforts. But because they intensely cultivated the land, which is fairly good around Rome, they drew from it plenty of grains and vegetables. If the property owners had the desire to increase the population, they would encourage peasants to marry young and raise children by promising to provide them with subsistence, devoting the land entirely to that purpose, and they would, doubtless, increase the population up to the point that the land could support, according to the products allotted for each person, whether those of an acre and a half or four to five acres. But if instead the prince or the property owners made them use the land for other purposes than the upkeep of the people. If, by the prices they offer in the market for commodities and merchandise, they determine that the farmers will employ the land for other purposes than the maintenance of men, for we have seen that the prices they offer in the market and their consumption determine the use made of the land just as if they cultivated it themselves. The people will necessarily decrease in number. Some will be forced to leave the country for lack of employment, while others, not having the necessary means of raising children, will not marry or will only marry late after having saved for the support of the household. If the property owners who live in the country move to the cities far away from their land, horses must be fed for the transport of food into the city for both the owner and all the domestic servants, artisans, and others whom their residence in the city will attract. The transport of wine from Burgundy to Paris often costs more than the wine itself costs in Burgundy. Consequently, the land employed for the upkeep of wagon horses and those who look after them is more considerable than the land that produces the wine and supports those who have taken part in its production. The more horses there are in a state, the less food will remain for the people. The upkeep of wagon, hunting, or show horses often takes three or four acres of land each. But when the nobility and property owners draw from foreign manufacturers their cloths, silk, laces, etc., and pay for them by sending to the foreigner their native products, they significantly diminish the subsistence of the inhabitants and increase that of foreigners who often become enemies of the state. If a nobleman or property owner in Poland, to whom his farmers yearly pay a rent equal to about one-third of the product of his land, 
uses the cloths, linen, etc. of Holland, he will pay for these goods one half of the rent he receives and perhaps use the other half for the subsistence of his family on other products and rough manufactures of Poland. However, half his rent, on our assumption, corresponds to one-sixth of the production of his land, and this sixth part will be carried away by the Dutch, to whom the farmers of Poland will deliver wheat, wool, hemp, and other products. Here, then, is a sixth part of the land of Poland withdrawn from its people, to say nothing of feeding of the wagon horses, carriage horses, and show horses maintained in Poland because of the lifestyle of the nobility. Furthermore, if out of the two-thirds of the production of the land allotted to the farmers, the latter, imitating their masters, consume foreign manufactures that they also pay to the foreigners in raw products of Poland, there will be a good third of the production of the land in Poland removed from the food of the people, and what is worse, mostly sent to foreigners and often serving to support the enemies of the state. If the property owners and the nobility in Poland would consume only the manufactures of their own state, bad as they might be at the outset, the products would soon become better and it would maintain a greater number of their own people at work instead of giving this advantage to foreigners. And if all states took precautions not to be the dupes of other states in matters of commerce, each state would be considerable only in proportion to its product and the industry of its people. If the ladies of Paris enjoy wearing Brussels lace, and if France pays for this lace with champagne wine, the production of a single acre of flax must be paid for with a production of 16,000 acres of vineyards, if my calculations are correct. This will be more fully explained elsewhere, and the figures are shown in the supplement. Suffice it to say that in this transaction, a great amount of the production of the land is withdrawn from the subsistence of the French, and all the products sent abroad, unless an equally considerable amount of products is brought back in exchange, tend to diminish the number of people in the state. When I said that the property owners might multiply the population as far as the land would support them, I assume that most men desire nothing better than to marry if they are set in a position to maintain their families in the same style as they are content to live themselves. That is, if a man is satisfied with the production of an acre and a half of land, he will marry if he is sure of having enough to maintain his family in the same style. However, if he is only satisfied with a product of five to ten acres, he will be in no hurry to marry unless he thinks he can support his family in the same manner. In Europe, the children of the nobility are brought up in affluence, and as the largest share of the property is usually given to the eldest sons, the younger sons are in no hurry to marry. They usually live as bachelors, either in the army or in the monasteries, but will seldom be found unwilling to marry if they are offered heiresses and fortunes or the means of supporting a family on the level they consider appropriate and without which they think they will make their children unhappy. In the lower classes of the state, there are also men who, from pride and from reasons similar to those of the nobility, prefer to live in celibacy and to live on the little that they have rather than settle down in family life but most of them would gladly set up a family if they could count on supporting their family as they wish. They would consider it an injustice to their children if they brought them up only to fall into a lower class than themselves. Only a few men in a state avoid marriage because of a pure libertine spirit. All the lower classes wish to live and raise children who can live at least like themselves. When laborers and artisans do not marry, it is because they wait until they save enough to enable them to set up a household or to find some young woman who brings a little capital for that purpose. Every day they see others like themselves who, for lack of such precautions, start a family and fall into the most frightful poverty, being obliged to deprive themselves of their own food in order to nourish their children. From the observations of Mr. Halley at Breslau in Silesia, a region in Poland, it is found that of all the females capable of childbearing from 16 up to 45 years of age, not one in six actually bears a child every year. Instead, says Mr. Halley, there ought to be at least four in six who should have children every year without including those who are barren or have stillbirths. The reason why four women out of six do not bear children every year is that they cannot marry because of the discouragement and difficulties in their way. A young woman takes care not to become a mother if she is not married. She cannot marry unless she finds a man who is ready to run the risk of it. Most of the people in a state are hired 
or are entrepreneurs. Most are dependent and live in uncertainty whether they will find by their labor or their enterprise the means of supporting their household on an acceptable level. Therefore, they do not all marry or marry so late that of six women, at least four should produce a child every year, but there is actually only one in six who becomes a mother. If the property owners help to support the families, a single generation would suffice to push the increase of population as far as the production of the land will supply the means of subsistence. Children do not require as much of the land's production as adults. Both can live on more or less according to their consumption. The northern people, where the land produces little, have been known to live on so little production that they have sent out colonists and swarms of men to invade the lands of the south, destroy the inhabitants, and appropriate their land. According to the different manner of living, 400,000 people might subsist on the same products of the land, which ordinarily supports only 100,000. A man who lives on the production of an acre and a half of land may be stronger and braver than one who consumes the production of five or ten acres. Therefore, it seems pretty clear that the number of inhabitants in a state depends on their means of subsistence. As the means of subsistence depend on the method of cultivating the soil, and this method depends chiefly on the taste, desires, and manner of living of the property owners, the increase and decrease of population also stand on the same foundation. The increase of population can be carried furthest in the countries where people are content to live the most poorly and to consume the least production of the soil. In countries where all the peasants and laborers are accustomed to eat meat and drink wine, beer, etc., not many inhabitants can be supported. Sir William Petty, and after him Mr. Davenant, inspector of the customs in England, seem to depart from nature when they try to calculate the propagation of the race by progressive generations from Adam, the first father. Their calculations seem to be purely imaginary and are to be drawn up at random. On the basis of what they have seen of the actual birth rate in certain districts, how could they explain the decreases of those innumerable people formerly found in Asia, Egypt, etc., and even in Europe? If 17 centuries ago there were 26 million people in Italy, now reduced to 6 million at most, how can it be determined by the progressions of Mr. King that England, which today contains 5 or 6 million inhabitants, will probably have 13 millions in a certain number of years? We see daily that Englishmen, in general, consume more of the product of the land than their fathers did. And this is the real reason why there are fewer inhabitants than in the past. Men multiply like mice in a barn if they have unlimited means of subsistence. The English in the colonies will become more numerous in proportion in three generations than they would in 30 in England, because in the colonies they cultivate new tracts of land from which they expel the savages. In all countries, at all times, men have waged war for the land and the means of subsistence. When wars have destroyed or diminished the population of a country, the savages and civilized nations soon repopulate it in times of peace, especially when the prince and the property owners lend their encouragement. A state which has conquered several provinces may, by tribute imposed on the vanquished, acquire an increase of subsistence for its own people. The Romans drew a great part of their subsistence from Egypt, Sicily, and Africa, and that is why Italy then had so many inhabitants. A state where mines are found, where manufacturers do not require much of the production of the land to export their goods to foreign countries, and which receives from them, in exchange, plentiful merchandise and commodities from the land, provides a larger subsistence fund for its subject. The Dutch exchange their labor in navigation, fishing, and manufacturing principally with foreigners, for the product of their land. Otherwise, Holland could not support half of its population. England buys from abroad considerable amounts of timber, hemp, and other materials or products of the soil, and consumes much wine for which she pays in minerals, manufactured goods, etc. That saves the English a great quantity of the production of their soil. Without these advantages, the people of England, based on their standard of living, could not be as numerous as they are. The coal mines save them several million acres of land, which would otherwise be needed to grow timber. But all these advantages are refinements and exceptional cases, which I mention only incidentally. The natural and constant way of increasing population in a state is to find employment for the people there and to make the land provide their means of support.
It is also a question outside of my subject whether it is better to have a great multitude of inhabitants, poor and badly provided for, or a smaller number with better means. A million who consume the products of six acres per head, or four million who live on the product of an acre and a half. Chapter 16. The more labor there is in a state, the more the state is judged naturally rich. Abstract. The wealth of a nation depends on putting the labor force to work. Those who are unnecessary for farming can be employed in making higher quality products and manufactured goods, particularly durable goods made from metal. Saving is the key determinant of wealth, and gold is a particularly useful form of savings because it can purchase all things, even in time of war. The prince and property owners determine how people will be employed by their consumption choices, while the Catholic Church reduces the resources available to materially sustain the people. In a long calculation included in the supplement, it is shown that the labor of 25 adults is sufficient to provide for 100 other adults with all the necessities of life, according to the European standard of living. In these estimates, it is true that food, clothing, housing, etc. are coarse and rather elementary, but there is ease and abundance. It may be assumed that a good third of the people in a state are too young or too old for daily work, and that another sixth are property owners, sick, or entrepreneurs of different sorts, who do not, by the labor of their hands, contribute to the different needs of men. That makes half the people without work, or at least without the work in question. So if 25 persons do all the work needed for the maintenance of 100 others, there remains 25 persons out of the 100 who are capable of working but have nothing to do. The soldiers and the domestic servants in well-to-do families will form part of these 25. And if all the others are employed refining, by additional labor, the things necessary for life, like making fine linen, fine cloth, etc., the state will be judged rich in proportion to this increase in labor, though it adds nothing to the quantity of things needed for the subsistence and maintenance of men. Labor gives an additional taste to food and drink. A fork, a knife, etc., finely made, are more valuable than those roughly and hastily made. The same may be said of a house, a bed, a table, and everything needed for the comforts of life. It is true that it is of little difference in a state whether people are accustomed to wear coarse or fine clothes, if both are equally lasting, and whether people eat nicely or coarsely, if they have enough and are in good health. Drink, food, clothing, etc. are equally consumed, and whether finely or coarsely produced, this type of wealth is not permanent. But it is always true to say that the states where fine clothes, fine linen, etc. are worn, and where people eat properly and delicately, are considered rich compared to those where these things are cruder. Furthermore, the states where one sees more people living in the finest manner are considered wealthier than those where one sees fewer in proportion. But if the 25 persons in 100 of whom we have spoken were employed to produce durable commodities like mining iron, lead, tin, copper, etc., and refining them into tools and instruments for the use of men such as bowls, plates, and other useful objects that are much more durable than earthenware, the state will not only appear to be richer, but will be in reality. It will be so especially if these people are employed in mining gold and silver from the earth, which are not only durable metals, but are, so to speak, permanent. Fire itself cannot destroy them. They are generally accepted as a measure of value, and they can always be exchanged for any of the necessities of life. And if these inhabitants work to bring gold and silver in a state, in exchange for the manufactures and work that they produce and send abroad, their labor will be equally useful and will, in reality, improve the state. The point that seems to determine the comparative greatness of states is the reserve stock above the yearly consumption, i.e. savings, like reserves of cloth, linen, grain, etc., to be used in times of need or war. And as gold and silver can always buy these things, even from the enemies of the state, gold and silver are the true reserve stock of a state, and the larger or smaller the actual quantity of this stock necessarily determines the comparative greatness of kingdoms and states. If it is the practice to import gold and silver from abroad by exporting the commodities and merchandise of the state, such as grain, wine, wool, etc., this will enrich the state, but at the expense of a decrease in population. However, if gold and silver are imported from abroad in exchange for the labor of the people, such as manufactured goods and articles which contain little of the production of the soil, 
this will enrich the state in a useful and essential manner. It is true that in a great state, the 25 persons in 100 of whom we have spoken cannot all be employed in making articles for foreign consumption. A million men, for example, would make more clothing than would be annually consumed in the entire commercial world. Most people in every country are clothed with local products, and there will seldom be found, in any state, 100,000 persons employed in making clothing for foreigners. This is shown in the supplement with regard to England, which, of all the nations in Europe, supplies the most cloth to foreigners. In order for the consumption of the manufacturers of a state to become significant in foreign countries, the goods must be well made and highly respected by a large consumption inside the state. This is necessary to discredit all foreign manufacturers and give plenty of employment to the inhabitants. If enough employment cannot be found to occupy the 25 persons in 100 with work that is useful and profitable to the state, I see no objection to encouraging employment which serves only for ornament or amusement. The state is not considered less rich for a thousand toys which serve to entertain the ladies or even men or are used in games and diversions than it is for useful and serviceable objects. It is said that Diogenes at the siege of Corinth would roll his barrel so that he might not seem idle while all others were at work. And we have today societies of men and women occupied in work and exercise as useless to the state as that of Diogenes. As long as the labor of a man supplies ornament or even amusement in a state, it is worthwhile to encourage it, unless the man can find a way to employ himself usefully. It is always the inspiration of the property owners which encourages or discourages the different occupations of the people and the different kinds of labor that they invent. The example of the prince, followed by his court, is generally capable of determining the inspiration and tastes of the other property owners, and the example of these last naturally influences all the lower ranks. Therefore, and without a doubt, a prince is able, by his own example and without any constraint, to give such a turn as he likes to the labor of his subjects. If each owner in a state had only a little piece of land, like that which is usually leased to a single farmer, there would hardly be any cities. The people would be more numerous and the state richer if every owner employed the inhabitants supported on his land with some useful work. However, when the nobles have great estates, they necessarily bring about luxury and idleness. Whether an abbot at the head of 100 monks living on the produce of several fine estates, or a nobleman with 50 domestic servants and horses kept only for his service live on these estates, would be indifferent to the state, if it could remain in constant peace. But a nobleman with his retinue and his horses is useful to the state in time of war. He can always be useful in the judicial system and the keeping of order in the state in peacetime. And in every case, he is a great ornament to the country, while the monks are, as people say, neither useful nor ornamental in peace or war on this side of heaven. The convents of mendicant friars are much more pernicious to a state than those of the closed orders. The closed orders usually do no more harm than to occupy estates which might serve to supply the state with officers and judges, while the mendicants, who are themselves without useful employment, often interrupt and hinder the labor of other people. They take from poor people, in charity, the subsistence which ought to fortify them for their labor. They cause them to lose much time in useless conversations, not to speak of those who involve themselves in families and those who are malicious. Experience shows that the countries which have embraced Protestantism and have neither monks nor mendicants have become visibly more powerful. They also have the advantage of having suppressed a great number of holy days when no work is done in Roman Catholic countries, and which diminish the labor of the people by about an eighth part of the year. If a state wanted to achieve its full potential, it might be possible, it seems to me, to diminish the number of mendicants by incorporating them into the monasteries as vacancies or deaths occur. This could be done while still providing places in the monastery for those who show little or no aptitude in speculative sciences but who are capable of advancing the practical arts, i.e. in some area of mathematics. The celibacy of churchmen is not as disadvantageous as is popularly believed, as is shown in the preceding chapter, but their idleness is very harmful. Chapter 17. Metals and Money, and Especially of Gold and Silver Abstract. Gold and silver were highly valued before they were used as money. They hold many advantages over other goods such as durability, divisibility, transportability, and homogeneity. 
These are the reasons which led gold, silver, and copper to be chosen as money, not fancy or common consent. When princes debase money or issue imaginary money, they hurt the economy. As land produces more or less grain according to its fertility and the labor expended on it, so do the mines of iron, lead, tin, gold, silver, etc. produce more or less of these metals according to the richness of the mines and the quantity and quality of the labor expended upon them in digging, draining, smelting, refining, etc. Work in silver mines is expensive because of the mortality it causes, and rarely does one last more than five or six years in this work. The real or intrinsic values of metal is, like everything else, proportional to the land and labor that enter into their production. The outlay on the land for this production is considerable only so far as the owner of the mine can obtain a profit from the work of the miners when the veins are unusually rich. The land needed for the subsistence of the miners and workers, that is the mining labor, is the principal expense and often the downfall of the owner. The market value of metals, as with other commodities and merchandise, is sometimes above, sometimes below, the intrinsic value, and varies with their abundance or scarcity, according to demand. If the property owners in the lower classes in a state who imitate them rejected the use of tin and copper, wrongly supposing that they are injurious to health, and if they all use dishes and utensils of earthenware, these metals would be at a very low price in the markets, and the work that was carried on to extract them from the mine would be discontinued. But as these metals are found useful and are employed in everyday life, they will always have a market value corresponding to their abundance or scarcity, and the demand for them. These metals will always be mined in order to replace what is lost by daily use. Iron is not only useful for daily life, but may be said to be, in a certain way, necessary. And if the Native Americans, who did not make use of iron before the discovery of their continent, had found mines and had known how to use it, there is little doubt that they would have labored to produce it, whatever the cost. Gold and silver are capable of serving not only the same purpose as tin and copper, but also most of the purposes of lead and iron. They have this further advantage over other metals in that they are not consumed by fire and are so durable that they may be considered permanent. It is not surprising, therefore, that the men who found the other metals useful valued gold and silver even before they were used in exchange. The Romans prized them from the time of the foundation of Rome and yet only used them as money 500 years later. Perhaps all other nations did the same and only adopted these metals as money long after using them for other purposes. However, we find from the oldest historians that from time immemorial, Gold and silver were used as money in Egypt and Asia, and we learn in the book of Genesis that silver monies were made in the time of Abraham. Let us assume that silver was first found in a mine in Mount Nephates in Mesopotamia. It is natural to think that one or more property owners, finding this metal to be beautiful and useful, were the first to use it, and willingly encouraged the miner or entrepreneur to extract more of it from the mine, giving him, in return for his work and that of his assistants, as much of the production of the land as they needed for their maintenance. This metal became more and more highly valued in Mesopotamia because as the large landowners bought ewers made of silver, the lower classes, according to their means or savings, would buy silver cups. The entrepreneur of the mine, seeing a constant demand for his goods, certainly placed a value proportional to its quality or weight against the other commodities or merchandise which he took in exchange. While everybody looked on this metal as a precious and durable object and strove to own a few pieces of it, the entrepreneur who alone could supply it was in a position to demand, in exchange, an arbitrary quantity of other commodities and merchandise. Assume now that on the other side of the Tigris River, and therefore outside Mesopotamia, a new silver mine is discovered, of which the veins are exceptionally richer and larger than those of Mount Nephates and that the working of this new mine, which was easily drained, required less labor than that of the first. The entrepreneur of this new mine was naturally in a position to supply silver much cheaper than the entrepreneur of Mount Nephates. The people of Mesopotamia who wished to have pieces and objects of silver would find it more advantageous to export their merchandise and give it to the entrepreneur of the new mine in exchange for silver, rather than obtaining it from the original entrepreneur. The first mine owner, finding a smaller demand, would of necessity reduce his price, but the new entrepreneur lowering his price in proportion would obligate the first mine owner to stop his output.
then the price of silver, in exchange for other commodities and merchandise, would necessarily be fixed by the price at the new mine. Silver would then cost less to the people beyond the Tigris than to those of Mesopotamia, who had to bear the cost of transporting their commodities and merchandise far away to obtain silver. It is easy to conceive that when several silver mines were found and the property owners had developed a taste for this metal, they were imitated by the other classes. The pieces and fragments of silver, even when not worked up, were sought after eagerly because nothing was easier than to make such articles from them as were desired according to their quantity and weight. As this metal was at least valued at what it cost to be produced, a few people who possessed some of it, finding themselves in need, could pawn it to borrow the things they wanted and later even sell it outright. Hence there arose the custom of fixing its value in proportion to its quantity or weight in exchange for all products and merchandise. But as silver can be combined with iron, lead, tin, copper, etc., which are more common metals that are mined at less expense, the exchange of silver was subject to much fraud. This caused several kingdoms to establish mints in order to certify, by a public coinage, the true quantity of silver that each coin contains, and to give individuals who bring bars or ingots of silver to the mint the same quantity in coins bearing a stamp or certificate of the true quantity of silver they contain. The costs of these certificates or coinage are sometimes paid by the public or by the prince. It was the method followed in ancient times in Rome and today in England. Sometimes those who take silver to be coined pay for minting, as is the custom in France. Pure silver is hardly ever found in the mines. The ancients did not know the art of refining it to perfection. They always made the silver coins of fine silver, and yet those which remain of the Greeks, Romans, Jews, and Asians are never perfectly pure. Today we are more skilled. The secret for making pure silver has been discovered. However, the different methods of refining it are not part of my subject. Many authors have treated the subject, Mr. Boisard among others. I will only observe that there is a good deal of expense in refining silver, and for this reason, an ounce of fine silver is generally preferred to two ounces which contain one half of copper or other alloy. It is expensive to separate the alloy and extract the ounce of pure silver, which is in these two ounces, while by simply smelting, any other metal can be combined with silver in any proportion desired. When copper is sometimes used as an alloy to find silver, it is only to render it more malleable and more suitable to make objects out of it. But in the valuation of all silver, the copper or alloy is reckoned at nothing, and only the amount of fine pure silver is considered. For this reason, an assay is always made to ascertain the amount of pure silver. Assaying is merely refining a little piece of a bar of silver, for example, to find how much pure silver it contains and to judge the whole bar by this small sample. A small portion of the bar, 12 grains for example, is cut off and nicely weighed with scales that are so accurate, a thousandth part of a grain will sometimes turn to scale. Then the sample is refined by nitric acid or by fire and the copper or alloy separated. When the silver is pure, it is weighed again in the same scale, and if it then weighs 11 grams instead of 12, the assayer says that the bar is 11 parts fine, i.e. it contains 11 parts of pure silver and one of copper or alloy. This will be more easily understood by those who have had the curiosity to see assays carried out. There is nothing mysterious about it. Gold is assayed in the same way, with the only difference being that the degrees of fineness of gold are divided into 24 parts called carats. Since gold is more precious, and these carats are divided into 32 parts, while the degrees of fineness of silver are only divided into 12s called deniers, and these are each divided into 24 grains. Usage has conferred upon gold and silver the term intrinsic value to designate and signify the quantity of true gold or silver contained in a bar. However, in this essay, I have always used the term intrinsic value to signify the amount of land and labor that are entered into production, not having found any term more suitable to express my meaning. I mention this only to avoid misunderstanding. When the subject is not gold or silver, the term will always apply without any confusion. We have seen that the metals such as gold, silver, iron, etc. serve several purposes and have a value proportional to the land and the labor that enter into their production. In the second part of this essay, we will see that because of trade, men had to use a common measure in order to find the proportion and value of the commodities and merchandise they wished to exchange.
The only question is what commodity or merchandise would be most suitable for this common measure and whether it was necessity rather than choice, which has given this preference to gold, silver, and copper, which are generally in use today for this purpose. Ordinary products like grain, wine, meat, etc. have a real value and serve the needs of life, but they are all perishable and difficult to transport and therefore are hardly suitable to serve as a common measure. Goods such as cloth, linen, leather, etc. are also perishable and cannot be subdivided without in some way changing their value for the service of men. Like raw produce, they cost a good deal to transport and they even are expensive to store. Consequently, they are unsuitable as a common measure. Diamonds and other precious stones, even if they had no intrinsic value and were demanded only by taste, would be suitable for a common measure if they were not susceptible to imitation and if they could be divided without loss. With these defects and that of being unserviceable in use, they cannot serve as a common measure. Iron, which is always useful and fairly durable, would not serve badly in absence of anything better. It is consumed by fire and is too bulky in large quantities. It was used from the time of Lycurgus in Sparta till the Peloponnesian War. But as its value is necessarily based intrinsically or in proportion to the land and labor that entered into its production, a great quantity of it was needed for a small value. It is curious that they spoiled the quality of iron coins with vinegar to make them unfit for other uses other than exchange. Thus, it could only serve the austere Spartans, and they themselves could not continue after they extended their interaction with other countries. To ruin the Spartans, one needed only to find rich iron mines to make money like theirs and use it to buy their commodities and merchandise, while they couldn't get anything from abroad for their spoiled iron. At that time, they did not concern themselves with any foreign trade, but only with war. Lead and tin have the same disadvantage of bulk as iron and are consumable by fire. But in case of necessity, they would not do badly for exchange if copper was not more suitable and durable. Copper alone served as money to the Romans until 484 years after the founding of Rome, and in Sweden it is still used even for large payments. However, it is too bulky for very considerable payments, and the Swedes themselves prefer payment in gold or silver rather than in copper. In the American colonies, tobacco, sugar, and cocoa have been used as money, but these commodities are too bulky, perishable, and of unequal quality. Therefore, they are hardly suitable to serve as money or as a common measure of value. Gold and silver alone are of small volume, equal quality, easily transported, divisible without loss, convenient to keep, beautiful and brilliant articles are made from them, and they are almost eternally durable. Everyone who has used other articles for money returns them as soon as they can get enough for exchange. It is only in the smallest purchases that gold and silver are unsuitable. Gold or even silver coins of the value of a liard or a denier would be too small to be handled easily. It is said that the Chinese, in small transactions, cut off little pieces with scissors from their plates of silver and weigh the pieces. But since their trade with Europe, they have begun to use copper for such occasions. It is then not surprising that all countries manage to use gold and silver as money or a common measure of value and copper for small payments. Utility and need decided for them and not taste or consent. Silver requires much labor and expensive labor for its production. Silver miners are highly paid because they rarely live more than five or six years at this work, which causes a high mortality. Therefore, a little silver coin corresponds to as much land and labor as a large copper coin. Money, or the common measure of value, must correspond in fact and reality in terms of land and labor to the articles exchanged for it. Otherwise, it would only have an imaginary value. For example, if a prince or a republic gave currency in the state to something that had no real and intrinsic value, not only would the other states refuse to accept it on that basis, but the inhabitants themselves would reject it when they perceived its lack of real value. When towards the end of the First Punic War, the Romans wished to give their copper coin the as which weighed two ounces, the same value as the as of one pound or twelve ounces had before. It could not long be maintained in exchange. The history of all time shows that when princes have debased their money, keeping it at the same nominal value, all raw commodities and merchandise have gone up in price in proportion to the debasement of the coinage. 
Mr. Locke says that the consent of mankind has given its value to gold and silver. This cannot be doubted since absolute necessity had no share in it. It is the same consent that is given and does give every day a value to lace, linen, fine cloths, copper, and other metals. Man could subsist without any of these things, but it must not be concluded that they have only an imaginary value. They have a value proportional to the land and labor that enter into their production. Gold and silver, like other goods and food products, can only be produced at costs roughly proportional to the value set upon them, and whatever a man produces by labor, this labor must provide his maintenance. It is the great principle that one hears every day from the mouths of the humble classes who have no part in our speculations and who live by their labor or their enterprise, everybody must live.